Nearly 60 years after her death, Marilyn Monroe's face remains one of the most recognizable in Hollywood. But things were not easy for Monroe, as the actress experienced a great deal of tragedy during her relatively short life. This is the tragic real-life story of Marilyn Monroe. The woman the world recognizes as Marilyn Monroe was born Norma Jean Mortensen on June 1, 1926 and baptized Norma Jean Baker. Monroe never knew who her father was. In her unfinished memoir, My Story, she wrote that her mother had a picture of a man who looked like actor Clark Gable, but wouldn't tell her daughter his name. Subsequently, whenever Monroe thought of her father, she pictured Gable, whom she even starred opposite in her final movie, The Misfits. Meanwhile, Monroe's mother, Gladys Baker, experienced a number of mental health issues over the course of her life. Within two weeks of Monroe's birth, Baker had put her in the care of foster parents. Baker would be in and out of mental health institutions all her life and wouldn't re-establish a relationship with her daughter for many years to come. After Gladys Baker was taken to an institution for the first time, Monroe lived with her mother's former lodgers and then with neighbors who offered to legally adopt her. Baker, however, refused to let this happen. Monroe next went to live with Baker's best friend, Grace McKee, but in 1935, McKee could no longer afford to care for her and took her to the Los Angeles Orphans Home Society. Here, Monroe was nothing less than miserable. Two years later, McKee, now married, took Monroe back to live with her and new husband Doc Goddard. Soon after, the Goddards also put Monroe in foster care. At the time, being a foster parent was seen more as a money-making scheme than an act of compassion. During her childhood, Monroe lived with 12 different families, many of whom were neglectful or abusive. Monroe later said she was sexually assaulted by a lodger in one of the homes and developed a stutter as a result of the trauma. After all this, the Goddards eventually took Monroe back, but it wouldn't last. When the Goddards again could no longer afford to look after Marilyn Monroe, she went to live with Grace's aunt, Anna Lower, who provided her with the most loving and stable home she'd ever had. When Monroe was 15, Doc Goddard got a job in West Virginia and the Goddards couldn't afford to take Monroe with them. But with Lower getting older, they decided she could no longer take care of the now teenage Monroe either. Instead, the Goddards arranged for Monroe to marry their neighbor, 21-year-old James Doherty, when she turned 16. In late 1943, Doherty joined the Merchant Marine and was deployed overseas in 1944. Monroe, who had dropped out of high school, got a job making $20 a week in a defense plant. It was there that a photographer discovered her, igniting her Hollywood ambitions, ambitions that didn't involve being married at 18. She and Doherty divorced in September 1946. Doherty remarried twice and died in 2005. Marilyn Monroe's first show business job was modeling, which served as a stepping stone into the movies. She signed her first movie contract with Fox in 1946 and was dropped in 1947, and signed with Columbia in 1948, but was dropped again later that year. With her acting career proving unstable, Monroe struggled to pay her bills. In 1949, she agreed to pose naked for photographer Tom Kelly in exchange for 50 bucks, which she needed for a car payment. After Monroe's movie career took off the following year, the photos and the merchandise they were printed on became famous. In 1953, aspiring publisher Hugh Hefner bought the rights to one of the photos and made it the first centerfold in his new magazine, Playboy. According to the Washington Post, Monroe later said, I never even received a thank you from all those who made millions off a nude Marilyn photograph. She admitted that, despite Fox executives' nerves, her decision to be honest about why she had the photo taken ultimately boosted her career. Hefner's obsession with Monroe continued after her death and his. Although he never once met her, in 1992 he purchased the crypt next to hers for $75,000, which is creepy on pretty much every level. In 1952, retired baseball superstar Joe DiMaggio asked a friend to set him up with Marilyn Monroe. Being the most famous athlete in the country, DiMaggio got his dinner. Monroe had low expectations, but she was pleasantly surprised to find that DiMaggio was reserved and respectful. After engaging in a long-distance romance, on January 14, 1954, Monroe and DiMaggio married at San Francisco City Hall. Monroe later said they were drawn together by a need for stability, but in her mind, that didn't mean she was going to stop working. DiMaggio, however, wanted a housewife and disliked his wife's sex symbol status. These contrasting desires and DiMaggio's possessiveness created tension. 
Alia Kazan, with whom Monroe later had an affair, wrote that she told him DiMaggio struck her often and beat her up several times. In September 1954, after DiMaggio watched Monroe shoot the famous subway grade scene for the seven-year itch, the couple had a fight that turned violent. Monroe filed for divorce, citing mental cruelty as the reason. DiMaggio begged for forgiveness, but Monroe refused. The couple reconnected as friends during the Christmas of 1961. DiMaggio tried to help with her addictions and mental health issues, and later blamed himself for her death. After arranging Monroe's funeral, he had roses delivered to her crypt three times a week for the next 20 years. The widely accepted version of Marilyn Monroe's rags-to-riches story is that she took a few pretty photos and immediately became a movie star. But Monroe worked hard to go from factory worker to Hollywood icon. As a model, Monroe studied her photos and constantly asked photographers for feedback. For five years, she took every job she was offered without complaint starting as an extra and climbing to bit parts. At Fox, she deliberately befriended studio reporters who were happy to give her a publicity boost. She also made an effort to improve her limited formal education, often reading classic literature on set. Monroe resented being typecast as a dumb blonde or seductress and wanted to prove that she could bring more to a movie than sex appeal. She took many acting classes, first at the Actors Lab in LA and later with famous acting coach Lee Strasberg at the Actors Studio in New York. In 1954, Monroe protested against the demeaning roles Fox kept sending her, as well as the studio's refusal to increase her salary, even though she was its biggest star. After walking out on her contract, Monroe became the second woman ever to found her own production studio, which she named after herself. The rebellion worked, too. Fox raised her salary and gave her greater creative control over her career. Despite her determination to make it in Hollywood, Marilyn Monroe suffered from terrible stage fright. Don Murray, who starred opposite her in 1956's Bus Stop, has revealed that Monroe got so nervous before every scene that she'd break out in a rash. She struggled to learn lines and forgot technical requirements like hitting her mark, walking out of the light, or out of focus. These problems meant that editors often had to patchwork together many takes to form a usable scene. She was frequently also late to set. Murray later told the LA Times, I think it was a lack of confidence. For somebody who the camera loved, she was still terrified. Other collaborators had the same problem. Jack Lemmon, who co-starred alongside Monroe in 1959's Some Like It Hot, recalled that it once took her over 37 takes to finish one simple scene. But he also told an interviewer that he never held this against her, and he knew that she could do scenes in one take because he'd seen her do it. And that the next morning we came in and did the whole upper berth scene, that whole first take before he goes down to get the booze, in one. And uh, she had it in the first crack, so you never know. Marilyn Monroe met her third husband, Pulitzer Prize-winning playwright Arthur Miller, on a movie set in 1951. Although each felt an attraction to the other, they didn't act on it until 1955. Monroe had divorced DiMaggio, but Miller was still married at the time. In 1956, during his divorce, Miller was subpoenaed by the House Un-American Activities Committee and risked being blacklisted by Hollywood. Monroe was advised to leave him for the sake of her career, but she refused. On June 29, 1956, eight days after his testimony, they married. There were happier times ahead for the couple, but Monroe ultimately needed more emotional support than Miller could give, and the glamour quickly faded for him. At one point, Monroe found a diary entry Miller had written saying he was, quote, disappointed and embarrassed by her. Miller made his feelings on their relationship public in the screenplay of 1961's The Misfits, which he wrote to give Monroe the chance to show her dramatic skills, while also clearly basing her sweet but neurotic character Rosalind on her personality. The shoot was a disaster, and they divorced shortly after. In the end, Miller didn't even attend Monroe's funeral. In an unpublished essay he began that day, Miller wrote that he didn't want to be around the false people he knew would be there. In 1987, he summed up his feelings toward Monroe. He was a super sensitive instrument, and that's exciting to be around until it starts to self-destruct. Despite her own dysfunctional upbringing, Marilyn Monroe longed to have a child. Unfortunately, she was never able to carry a pregnancy to term. During her marriage to Arthur Miller, she suffered two miscarriages and an ectopic pregnancy. Monroe worried that her alcohol and drug abuse could have caused the problems she experienced with pregnancy. 
However, she also had endometriosis, an extremely painful condition in which the lining of the uterus spreads into other parts of the reproductive system. Some studies have found that endometriosis increases the risk of miscarriage. It was also rumored that Monroe chose to have several abortions throughout her life. This would have been illegal, and therefore unregulated and potentially unsafe, but it wasn't unusual. Hollywood studios had strict clauses about pregnancy and children for their female stars, and a number of legendary actresses chose to have abortions rather than lose their careers and income. It's thought Marilyn Monroe was initially prescribed painkillers for her endometriosis and barbiturates and other sedatives for her insomnia. When she died, her bedside table was covered in bottles of medicines. She also drank heavily. Some of the medication Monroe took was for depression. Many have also tried to diagnose Monroe with a personality disorder, but if she was ever diagnosed with one to her face, she never made it public. It seems fair to say that Monroe's mental health had consistently been up and down, and she attempted suicide at least once in her life. I think you're the saddest girl I ever met. The first man ever said that. I'm usually told how happy I am. About a month after filing for divorce from Miller, Monroe signed herself into the Payne Whitney Psychiatric Ward in New York, claiming she was suffering from insomnia and simply needed to rest. Instead, she was locked in a padded room and prevented from leaving. Joe DiMaggio, with whom she'd recently reunited, eventually managed to force his way into the hospital and get her released. Marilyn Monroe was found dead by her housekeeper, Eunice Murray, early in the morning of August 5, 1962. The coroner's report concluded that she had died of an overdose of barbiturates and a probable suicide. However, many have refused to accept this as the truth, and the circumstances around Monroe's death have been subject to a number of conspiracy theories over the years. These are fueled by the fact that witness testimonies regarding her death generally contradicted each other. Some say Monroe was in good spirits leading up to her death. She'd been working hard to revamp her image after being fired and then rehired on a movie project. But other people, including her psychiatrist, Dr. Ralph Greenson, said that she was agitated on the day she died. At one point, Eunice Murray, whom Monroe had fired days earlier, claimed that Bobby Kennedy had visited Monroe the day she died, which the FBI investigated and later dismissed. Monroe was barely 36 when she died. The true tragedy of her life is that she was a complicated, fragile, yet determined person who quickly found fame but never quite found true love or stability. If you or anyone you know is having suicidal thoughts, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. Mysterious phone taps, an alleged affair with a Playboy president, deadly pills. Marilyn Monroe may be the most iconic actress ever to grace a movie screen, but the truth of her life will shock you. Marilyn Monroe was born Norma Jean Mortensen and christened Norma Jean Baker in California in 1926. At two weeks old, her mother Gladys Baker left her with foster parents Ida and Wayne Bolander, who were strict but mostly provided a loving and stable home. Her father was absent, but Norma was close to her foster brothers and sisters, and her mother would come to visit whenever she could, sometimes having the young Norma over to stay for a few days at a time in her apartment in Hollywood. However, the relationship fractured when Gladys tried to kidnap Norma in a duffel bag, as well as when her later attempt to adopt the child was rejected. Attempts by Ida to reunite mother and daughter later on were initially successful, but before long, Gladys' mental instability led to her being diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic and sent to a mental institution. Norma was eight years old. From this point, she only saw her mother occasionally, being sent to live with family friend Grace Goddard, Gladys' sister-in-law, Goddard's friend Edith Anna Lower, and in the Los Angeles Orphans' Home. When Goddard and her husband moved to West Virginia, Norma was faced with the possibility of going back into state care. However, according to the LA Times, she instead agreed to an arranged marriage at 16. Her husband, James Doherty, was five years older and had started dating her when she was only 15. By the outbreak of World War II, young Norma Doherty was spending her days as a solitary housewife while her husband served abroad as a merchant seaman. He initially taught sea safety in Catalina Island, just off the coast of Los Angeles, where the couple had an apartment. However, in his absence, Norma decided to take a job in industry for the war effort. She worked in an assembly line for the company Radioplane. 
inspecting and spraying parachutes attached to remote-controlled aircraft in a factory in Burbank, California. Her role involved working 10 hours a day for $20 per week, and Norma was warned by her mother-in-law that it would cause major damage to her hair and her health. Yet in 1944, Monroe was photographed as part of an army moving picture series on women in war production. It was a life-changing moment, as the image led to her becoming an in-demand model in Los Angeles. By coincidence, the man who set up the photo shoot was future actor and President Ronald Reagan. Despite their youth and limited time together, Norma and James Doherty were genuinely in love. As stardom beckoned, the pressure on Norma to be unmarried increased. Despite her husband's attempts to talk her out of it, she served him divorce papers and the marriage ended in September 1946. Norma, who had signed a contract with 20th Century Fox, went on to conquer Hollywood. Ooh, do you feel the breeze from the Segway? Isn't it delicious? Despite her talent, charm, and humor, Marilyn Monroe could be bewildering and exasperating to work with. According to the LA Times, she would often arrive late on sets, particularly when working with stars she was intimidated by, like Ethel Merman. She worked with some of the most famous names of the day, including director Billy Wilder, but would cause exasperation by sometimes not showing up at all or having to do the same takes over and over again. This all meant she was eventually fired from the production of the unfinished film from 1962, Something's Gotta Give. Monroe demonstrated other quirks, such as referring to herself in the third person, with photographer Sam Shaw recounting hearing her go over Marilyn's performances, saying she wouldn't do this or that. According to Vogue, Monroe would try to enhance her on-set glow by smearing herself all over with Vaseline in an attempt to look more luminous. These quirks and insistence on her own schedule were often interpreted as a sign of Monroe's drug-addled self-absorption but it was a sign of something far deeper and sadder. I think you're the saddest girl I ever met. You're the first man ever said that. Many of Marilyn Monroe's eccentricities were rooted in how uneasy she felt while in front of the camera, so much so that she became notorious for forgetting her lines and often found it hard to string sentences together. According to The Independent, director Billy Wilder took to hiding snippets of the actor's lines within props on set so that she could read them furtively. Although her performances still garnered praise, it was a phobia she never fully recovered from. Beforehand, she would often have to be coaxed out of her trailer, with even just the prospect of being in front of the camera causing her to erupt into a full body rash. On set, her difficulties with remembering her lines would be coupled with her often missing the director's cues. This resulted in Monroe being out of focus at the wrong moment or shot in the wrong lighting, languishing in either too much or too little shadow. Despite being the envy of so many in the industry, Monroe never truly felt good enough. She even took secret acting classes with Lee Strasberg when she was famous, sauntering in and hovering near the back of the actor's studio in New York in the hopes of not being recognized. Miss Monroe worked in my classes, by the way, in the regular classes, and she also worked at the actor's studio. And despite her reputation for great natural beauty, a medical file from Dr. Michael Gurdon showed that she had plastic surgery on her chin and nose. The 1950s was a fearful period for the entertainment industry. Screenwriters, playwrights, and actors lived in fear of the blacklist, a notorious facsimile kept by Senator Joseph McCarthy of anyone accused of communistic sympathies. For those on the list, it could mean the end of their careers. Are you now under the direction of the Communist Party? Playwright Arthur Miller narrowly escaped this fate in 1956 when he was called to testify against suspected colleagues in front of the House Un-American Activities Committee. When he refused to do so, Marilyn Monroe, who was engaged to him, stayed loyal to her fiancé, despite warnings by her peers that it could permanently damage her career. Miller's announcement of his upcoming nuptials during the hearing was likely to have played out in his favor. He avoided a jail sentence, being given a suspended sentence that was overturned in 1958. Additionally, Miller and Monroe suffered no permanent public backlash. Yet the the FBI continued to nurse suspicions of Monroe. It also didn't help that she had requested to visit the Soviet Union in 1955. She never did make the trip, but the FBI opened a file on her. The real estate listing of her former home describes the discovery in the 1970s of an advanced telephone tapping system that reached into every room of her home. Its origins were never confirmed, although some believe it to have been done by the Mafia, as described by biographer Anthony Summers in Vanity Fair. Marilyn Monroe's turbulent upbringing made her long for a more stable home life. One of the brief times she achieved this was when she embraced Judaism as a way to be closer to husband Arthur Miller. Although Miller was not devout, Monroe was keen to play a part in his family's traditions, while also finding harmony and solace in the spirituality of Judaism. During her conversion period, she studied under Rabbi Robert Goldberg, who had given her Jewish texts to absorb and kept a prayer book scribbled with personal notes. The book was found among Monroe's possessions when she died. She was open about her identification with the history of persecution endured by many Jews, saying, according to the Atlanta Jewish Times, everybody's out to get them, no matter what they do, like me. 
Many of her friends and colleagues in New York, as well as in Hollywood, were Jewish. According to the Jewish Museum, her conversion was a sign of a profound transformation that was kept private from her more lightweight public persona. It was a sign of Monroe's rich, albeit troubled, inner world. Marilyn Monroe had a huge private library of around 430 books, nursing a habit as a voracious reader and ardent consumer of novels and poetry. As highlighted by open culture, the actor could be pictured hunched over copies of celebrated literary tomes such as Ulysses by James Joyce and iconic books of verse such as Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. Far from wanting to be portrayed as the flighty and empty-headed starlet that her public persona implied, she was most keen on being photographed while immersed in a book. It was part of a mostly doomed attempt to be taken more seriously as an artist as well as a person. Her taste in men reflected this. Arthur Miller, her second husband, was a highly successful playwright and literary heavyweight. But before him, Monroe's private fantasies had skewed towards older and even more intellectually formidable men. Actress Shelley Winters, her former roommate, said in an interview with the LA Times that during discussions about which men they would sleep with, Monroe had put forward the venerated scientist Albert Einstein as one of her ideal pinups. So much so that after her death, a silver-framed photograph of him was found propped up on her piano. Singer Frank Sinatra, one of Marilyn Monroe's friends and admirers, gifted a dog to her in 1916 named Mafia Honey, who was looked after by his secretary when she died. The Maltese Terrier's moniker was apparently a nod to the rumors that circled Sinatra about his links to organized crime. Moff lived with Monroe for the final two years of her life, during the period when she had separated from Arthur Miller and was regularly mingling with celebrity friends and peers in New York. The novelist Andrew O'Hagan later penned a work of fiction in 2010 that was told from the point of view of the orphaned Moff. The book, The Life and Opinions of Moff the Dog and of his friend Marilyn Monroe, imagines Monroe's pets as someone who is as well-read, thoughtful, and complicated as his mistress, occupying a front-row seat as a spectator in the final years of an icon. In an interview with Granta, O'Hagan said that he still felt there was still much to say about Monroe, adding, The human being, the woman, is too often obscured by the legend. I can be smart when it's important, but most men don't like it. He further said that he wanted to give short shrift to any of the conspiracy theories around Monroe's life and death, wanting to do some gentle debunking, and saying that he considers Moff, despite being a dog, to be, quote, saner than most of us. To say that Marilyn Monroe had a deeply troubled personal life would be an understatement. Having had a disrupted, often lonely upbringing where both her parents were either physically or emotionally absent, it was tragic that a stable home life was often far from her adult experience, too. Monroe often fell from men who did not have her best interests at heart. Her previous marriage to baseball player Joe DiMaggio had ended in 1954 after eight months due to his mental cruelty. It was a troubled union from the outset. History describes how Monroe cut short their honeymoon in Japan to perform for American soldiers stationed in Korea. As for DiMaggio, the Hall of Famer had been upset by his wife's overly sexualized image, to the point where he even hired a private investigator to try and prove that she was seeing someone else, despite the marriage already being in its death throes. Her third husband, Arthur Miller, spoke of how embarrassed he was by her when they were out in public, sending Monroe into a tailspin over the thought that she had let him down. Yet Monroe and DiMaggio remained on good terms, with DiMaggio securing Monroe's release from a traumatic psychiatric clinic in New York seven years after their divorce. Monroe's ex-husband was also the one to arrange her funeral when she died, and for 20 years afterwards, he sent flowers to her grave every week. Even in death, Marilyn Monroe can't seem to escape the public gaze. Decades on from her tragic demise, she remains legendary to the point that ardent fans, former lovers, and old associates have tried to buy the crypts above or near Monroe to be close to her for all of eternity. As the LA Times highlights, Joe DiMaggio had owned the crypt directly above the one earmarked for her in Westwood Cemetery in Los Angeles, but sold it after the couple's eight-month union came to an end. An acquaintance of DiMaggio, businessman Richard Poncher, took things to a ghoulish level when he bought the plot off him in 1954. Poncher's wife felt it unlikely that it was due to his being an ardent fan of Monroe, given that the actor's death was eight years away. However, when Poncher died, he reportedly threatened to haunt his wife relentlessly if she did not turn him over in his casket so that he would be upside down over Maryland for all time. His widow complied until 2009, when she decided to move the body and sell the crypt to pay off her mortgage. Founder of Playboy Hugh Hefner purchased the crypt right next to Monroe for $75,000, insisting that being next to the Hollywood legend forever was too good an opportunity to pass up. You know I'm a sucker for blondes, <laughs> and she is the ultimate blonde. The grave is notable as a pilgrimage point, with fans continuing to leave flowers and lipstick marks in tribute to Monroe. An overlooked aspect of Marilyn Monroe's career is that she was one of the first people to speak out against Hollywood's culture of rampant sexual harassment. 
As early as 1953, Monroe condemned a culture that allowed men to take advantage of her during the years when she was breaking into the film industry. In an article she penned for Motion Picture and Television magazine, she lashed out against the wolves who cornered her relentlessly, showering her with gifts or promising to further her career in return for sexual favors. Although she refused to take their money, she later said in her autobiography, My Story, I would be riding in their limousines and sitting beside them in swanky places. There was always a chance a job and not another wolf might spot you. Furthermore, as much as she had tried to avoid the predatory world of the casting couch, she found herself in situations where men lied about their film connections to secure a meeting with her. She described in her book how one man had offered her a fake audition and then started pawing her. In response, Monroe socked him in the eye before managing to escape. She was only much later given the credit for speaking out, with many of her male biographers having skated over her role as a low-key trailblazer. Questions have persisted over how much Marilyn Monroe's relationship with the Kennedy brothers might have been exploited by the Mafia, the FBI, and the Kennedy brothers themselves. Author Anthony Summers, who penned the recently updated biography Goddess, highlighted in Vanity Fair that Monroe's sexual relations with John F. Kennedy and his brother Bobby had led to her making a string of unanswered phone calls to them. Marilyn's calls were founded in the deluded belief that her pregnancy, which she didn't carry to term, would mean she would marry Bobby. This was her main fixation during her final hours. Soon, she would be tragically dead at the age of 36. As a form of blackmail, the Mafia, who sought greater influence among the Democrats, were involved in bugging Monroe's apartment in an effort to find damning evidence of the Kennedys' illicit sexual visits. Although the recordings proving it never emerged, it fed rumors that Monroe had been silenced to prevent national embarrassment. Misinformation and conflicting reports have abounded. The FBI file on Monroe claimed inaccurately that she had a conversation with JFK about the morality of atomic weaponry, even though the president was in a different part of the country. Novelist Andrew O'Hagan argued in an interview with Granta that Monroe and the Kennedys were hardly ever in the same place at the same time. Despite rumors that she was murdered, experts on Marilyn Monroe's life agreed that she died tragically of a drug overdose in 1962. She had suffered from substance abuse problems for a number of years, particularly her addiction to barbiturates, which she used as sleep aids. Monroe was found dead by her housekeeper at her home in Los Angeles, naked in bed with a phone receiver in her hand and an empty bottle of Nembutal, a sleeping drug, next to her. 12 to 15 medicine bottles were also found. It was widely considered to have been a suicide, although it wasn't known for sure. Monroe had been troubled for some time about her divorce from Arthur Miller, along with the rumors about her affairs with the Kennedy brothers and the fact that her career had been waning due to some of her films performing poorly. They included Let's Make Love from 1960 and 1961's The Misfits. She was fired from the set of Something's Got to Give due to her difficult antics while on set, although she negotiated her way into being rehired later in 1962. Prior to this point, the film studio had been trying to sue her for half a million dollars after her lateness and frequent absences on set caused expensive production delays. Ultimately, she could not overcome her addiction issues. Marilyn Monroe died troubled, but not forgotten. If you or anyone you know needs help with addiction issues, help is available. Visit the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration website or contact SAMHSA's National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP-4357. There are few pop culture images in American history more memorable than the iconic sight of Marilyn Monroe singing a sexy happy birthday wish to the country's 35th president, John F. Kennedy, at a gala held just days before his 45th birthday. I can now retire from politics after having had a happy birthday sung to me in such a sweet moment. The sultry performance lent plausibility to rumors that had already been swirling, claiming that the beautiful actress and the notoriously womanizing politician were having an affair. However, there is actually very little hard evidence proving that the two powerful figures ever had as scandalous a relationship as the public would like one to believe. The two only ever met a grand total of four times. The first time they were even in the same vicinity as each other was at the April in Paris Ball, which was held at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City on April 11, 1957. They both attended with their spouses, and there is no indication that they were even introduced at the event. Monroe and JFK's first documented meeting was in 1961, at a dinner party hosted by a mutual friend, the actor Peter Lawford. 
The actor was acquainted with both of them, as he was married to JFK's sister, Patricia, a woman whom Monroe became friendly with while filming the musical comedy, Let's Make Love. It was in his home where the two of them first met, and nothing reportedly romantic happened between the two of them then. Most historians agree Monroe and President Kennedy had only one real opportunity to become intimate. On March 24, 1962, they both attended a party at the home of famous crooner Bing Crosby in Palm Springs, California, after which it is believed they spent the night together. This was confirmed by Ralph Roberts, a close friend and personal masseur of Monroe's, who said she called him that evening asking for back massage tips, only to then put President Kennedy on the phone. Monroe's biographers believe that evening was the night the president extended the invitation for Monroe to attend his 45th birthday gala. Monroe biographer Donald Spoto wrote of their alleged affair, No serious biographer can maintain the existence of an affair between Monroe and the Kennedys. All we can say for sure is that the actress and the president have met four times between October 1961 and August 1962. And it was during one of those meetings that they called to a friendly relation of Marilyn from a bedroom. Shortly after, Marilyn Monroe confided this sexual relation to her close relatives, insisting about the fact that their affair ended there. Roberts confirmed that weekend in Palm Springs was likely the only private time the president and Monroe spent together, explaining, Marilyn told me that this night in March was the only time of her affair with JFK. A great many people thought, after that weekend, that there was more to it, but Marilyn gave me the impression that it was not a major event for either of them. It happened once, that weekend, and that was that. More recently, Tony Opetisano, the former road manager and close friend of Frank Sinatra, who was a mutual friend of both the starlet and the president, has claimed to know the real truth behind the nature of their relationship. While promoting his new book, Sinatra and Me, in the wee small hours, Opetisano told People magazine that Monroe, quote, looked up to JFK, but added, she was enamored of him, she respected him, she admired him. But there was only so far that even she would go. Monroe wasn't about to break up the president's marriage, so she wouldn't let it go that far, even if she felt that deeply. Despite these feelings, she never claimed to be in love with Kennedy, and felt that taking up with a married man and a father, not to mention the President of the United States, and breaking up his marriage would go against her sense of ethics and morals. While Opetisano described the relationship as, quote, obviously a sexual thing, and said he expects there were feelings on her side, it never became a full-fledged romance. So although it is not out of the question that Monroe and JFK may have had a romantic tryst or two, according to Opetisano, the full-blown, scandalous love affair that people have gossiped about for years likely never really occurred. One of the most famous women in the world was found dead in the early hours of August 5, 1962. Since then, conflicting accounts and conspiracy theories have fought for attention. This is what it was really like the day Marilyn Monroe died. Exactly when Marilyn Monroe died is still unclear. Several key witnesses changed their stories over the years, most notably Monroe's housekeeper, Eunice Murray, who was the first to raise the alarm. Murray said that Monroe went to bed around 7.30 p.m. on Saturday, August 4, 1962, and that was the last time she saw her alive. She said, uh, good night, Mrs. Murray. I think I'll turn in now. Two other witnesses, actor Peter Lawford, who was the brother-in-law to John and Robert Kennedy, and Joe DiMaggio Jr., Monroe's former stepson, said they spoke to her on the phone around that time, but their accounts of her mood contradict each other. Murray revealed that she knocked on Monroe's door at around midnight, and when there was no answer, she called Monroe's psychiatrist, Dr. Ralph Greenson. Greenson and Murray went outside and saw through the first-floor bedroom window that Monroe was lying motionless, face down on her bed. Murray and Greenson broke into the room through a window. Unable to rouse Monroe, Greenson called her physician, Dr. Hyman Engelberg, who reportedly arrived a little while later. The Los Angeles Times reported that at 4.20 a.m., Engelberg called the police and reported that Monroe was dead. I suspected that she'd been dead at least a few hours. The police arrived approximately five to ten minutes later. This account leaves a significant gap between Murray finding the body and the police being called. Murray later changed her story, saying that she found Monroe at around 3 a.m. after noticing light under her bedroom door and being unable to wake her or get into the room. 
It wasn't until Monday, August 6th, that major newspapers made Marilyn Monroe's death front-page news. Bernie Toppin and Elton John's famous tribute to Monroe, Candle in the Wind, would later claim all the papers had to say was that Marilyn was found in the nude. In fact, the newspapers were at least as interested in another salacious detail, and that was the drugs at the scene. The New York Times, BBC, LA Times, New York Daily Times, and Variety all reported on the empty bottle of Nembutal, a sleeping medication that was found near Monroe's body. According to the LA Times, it had been prescribed by Dr. Engelberg just a few days before her death, and had contained 40 to 50 capsules when filled. The New York Times added that the nightstand held 14 other medication bottles. PBS later reported that Monroe was known to regularly mix barbiturates, opiates, amphetamines, and alcohol. By August 6, the LA County coroner had told the press that an autopsy had shown that Monroe likely died of a drug overdose, and later described her death as a probable suicide. However, medical examiner Dr. Thomas Noguchi, who performed the autopsy, eventually admitted that samples from Monroe's intestines and stomach were lost before they could be put through toxicology tests. This has fueled conspiracy theories, but a 1982 investigation by the LA District Attorney agreed that Monroe's death was likely caused by an overdose, whether intentional or accidental. No one can know exactly what was going through Marilyn Monroe's head in her final moments, but that hasn't stopped plenty of people piling in with their opinions. One school of thought suggests that Monroe was more depressed than ever just before her death. She was divorced from her third husband, Arthur Miller, and during the marriage she had been through several miscarriages. Career-wise, her last two movies had been disappointments at the box office. On top of that, 1961's The Misfits had been tainted by disagreements with Miller, who had written the script. She'd also recently been fired from the movie Something's Got to Give, co-starring Dean Martin. In contrast, some have argued that, despite her concerning drug and alcohol use, Monroe was slowly turning a corner. She'd bought her first home in March 1961 and was adding her personal touches to it, planting an herb garden and ordering furniture and tapestries from Mexico. According to the BBC, she and Joe DiMaggio were planning to remarry soon, and she was returning to work on Something's Got to Give. Even the people who were with Monroe or spoke to her on her final day disagreed over her mood and will likely never know what she was feeling. There are many conspiracies surrounding Marilyn Monroe's death. All are far more elaborate than the explanation that the actress accidentally or intentionally overdosed. Possibly the most famous conspiracy involves Robert F. Kennedy, then Attorney General and brother of President John F. Kennedy. The story goes that Monroe had affairs with both Kennedy brothers, and wrote down details and state secrets in a diary that mysteriously went missing after her death. The Kennedys were a very important part of Marilyn's life. According to the LA Times, Peter Lawford's ex-wife Deborah Gould and private detective Fred O'Tash have both claimed that Robert Kennedy was present the night Monroe died, and an argument between them pushed her to suicide. They said that Lawford, then married to the Kennedy brothers' sister Patricia, helped smuggle Robert back to Northern California to avert suspicion and destroyed evidence. Another conspiracy has Robert, or the mob, murdering Monroe with a nembutal suppository. Lawford, unsurprisingly, denied these accusations. His fourth wife confirmed that Lawford did work with Otash, and he called him the night Monroe died, but she claimed it was regarding Monroe's apparent suicide. Lawford admitted that he spoke to Monroe the night of her death and said that he was gravely worried that she was suicidal, not that she was about to be murdered. Marilyn Monroe had been poised to make a triumphant return to a movie she had previously been fired from when she died suddenly. Monroe could be magic on camera, but capturing that magic was reportedly a grueling process. She had terrible stage fright and anxiety and struggled to remember her lines. She showed up late if she showed up at all, her drug and alcohol addictions only exacerbated the issues. In 1962, Monroe was cast in Something's Got to Give, a remake of a 1940 movie opposite Dean Martin. She frequently failed to turn up to set, usually citing illness, the LA Times reports, and Monroe had been ill. After finishing The Misfits 18 months previously, the star had undergone surgeries to treat endometriosis and remove her gallbladder, and had been treated in a psychiatric clinic after divorcing Arthur Miller. On June 1st, Monroe turned 36 on set. 
On June 8th, having missed 17 of the 30 shooting days so far, she was fired from Something's Got to Give. Fox cited what it called willfully disruptive behavior. However, Monroe's co-star Martin rebelled, refusing to work with any other actress. Monroe took to the press to prove that she was not only capable of working, but a draw for fans. On August 1st, she was rehired to the production. However, when she was found dead on August 5th, the movie was canceled for good. On January 14, 1954, less than two years after meeting, Marilyn Monroe and baseball star Joe DiMaggio eloped. However, arguments over her career and inability to conceive saw Monroe file for divorce in October 1954, citing mental cruelty. Despite their short and tumultuous marriage, Monroe and DiMaggio eventually became good friends. When Monroe was admitted against her will to a psychiatric hospital in 1961, she called DiMaggio for help, and he got her out, the New York Times reports. There were also rumors that the couple had planned to remarry before her sudden death. According to the Washington Post, DiMaggio learned of Monroe's death from his sister, who had heard the news on the radio. He immediately flew to LA, collected her body, and took charge of funeral arrangements, with help from Monroe's business manager. DiMaggio spent the night of August 5th sitting with Monroe's body. He even picked out the green sheath dress the icon was buried in. DiMaggio refused to allow many of Monroe's Hollywood connections to attend her funeral, reportedly saying, if it wasn't for them, she'd still be here. Marilyn Monroe met her third husband, Arthur Miller, the year before meeting her second husband, Joe DiMaggio. It was on a movie set in 1951. Miller was married and Monroe was having a fling with one of his friends. Four years and one divorce later, they started an affair. Miller eventually got a quickie divorce in Reno, Nevada, and on June 29, 1956, he and Monroe legally married. The couple had a Jewish ceremony two days later, which Monroe had converted for. Sadly, Miller and Monroe's marriage was undermined by his snobbery and her emotional issues. They split while making The Misfits and announced their divorce on November 11, 1960. Miller remarried a year after the separation. On August 6, 1962, the day after Monroe's body was found, the New York Times reported that when Miller was asked if he had a comment on her death, he was typically aloof, saying, I don't really. Miller was criticized for not attending Monroe's funeral on August 8. However, in an unpublished essay written that day and made public in 2018, he expressed his anger with the Hollywood elite and executives he felt had destroyed Monroe. In the essay, he expressed a sentiment Joe DiMaggio apparently shared, writing, Let the public mourners finish the mockery. Most of them there destroyed her. Marilyn Monroe's second and third husbands were famous in their own right, but it was her first husband whose unstarry job meant he was one of the very first people to hear about her death. Monroe married James Doherty on June 19, 1942, less than three weeks after her 16th birthday, when he was 21. Back then, her name was Norma Jean Baker. Monroe had been raised by a series of foster families, and they hoped this marriage to a kind neighbor would give her stability. Doherty joined the Merchant Marines in 1944 and was soon dispatched to the South Pacific. In the meantime, Monroe started working on her modeling and acting career. She divorced Doherty in 1946. Doherty remarried soon after and became a police officer in Los Angeles. He was on patrol when a colleague who had been to Monroe's house called to tell him that she was dead. In comments reflecting those of Monroe's other ex-husbands, he told CNN in 2003, she was such a pure and innocent soul. The movie industry abused her and used her. On August 6, the New York Times reported that actress Sophia Loren cried when she heard the news. The newspaper also wrote that Kay Gable, whose late husband Clark Gable had worked with Monroe on 1961's The Misfits, went straight to mass to pray. According to Vanity Fair, author Truman Capote couldn't believe Monroe was dead, writing, She was such a good-hearted girl. So pure, really. So much on the side of the angels. One person whose response many people were interested in was the wife of the man Monroe had supposedly had an affair with. That would be First Lady Jackie Kennedy. Jackie remained characteristically demure on the subject, at least in public. But after the assassination of her husband on November 22, 1963, she reportedly told a priest, I was glad that Marilyn Monroe got out of her misery. The day Marilyn Monroe's death made headlines coincided with the 34th birthday of a commercial artist who had long been fascinated by her. 
Andy Warhol immediately started working on the first of several artworks he made featuring Monroe's image. Back then, Warhol's day job was drawing pictures for ads. In his spare time, he poured his expertise in branding into creating pop art. To Warhol, Monroe was the perfect example of intoxicating Hollywood celebrity, which saw stars repurposed as brands. He was also intrigued by death. Using a publicity still from Monroe's 1953 movie, Niagara, Warhol printed her face 50 times in a grid. The work showed the contrast between Marilyn the movie star, painted to attract attention, and Marilyn the person, always just out of view from her adoring public. Marilyn Monroe was dead, but her famous face would always be frozen in time, never evolving and never forgotten. If you or anyone you know is struggling with addiction issues, help is available. Visit the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration website or contact SAMHSA's National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP-4357. Marilyn Monroe was a silver screen legend who today remains as iconic as ever. But those who were close to her didn't see her in the same way the public did. James Doherty married Marilyn Monroe in 1942. She was just 16 at the time and still going by her baptized name, Norma Jean Baker. The relationship was a way out of a difficult childhood, spent in orphanages and passed around by various relatives, including some who sexually abused her. While the future movie star filed for divorce just over four years later, Doherty would forever be connected with her and asked about her endlessly. Even his obituary in the Los Angeles Times is mostly quotes of things he'd said about her over the years. And the headline makes clear why a former police officer's death made the paper. James Doherty, 84, was married to Marilyn Monroe before she became a star. To Doherty's credit, he never pretended he knew the iconic version of Monroe. He almost always called his ex-wife Norma Jean when asked about her. He appeared on Larry King Live in 2002 and spoke about why their relationship fell apart. She became a movie actress, so she wanted to live together and maintain a relationship. And I told her, no, that I wanted a family. He swore he didn't hold a grudge over her leaving, though. As he explained, I thought it was wonderful that she was getting something that she wanted. And of course, Marilyn, I never knew. It's a shame that she had to give up half her life for that fame. I was very much in love with Norma Jean. The relationship between film star Marilyn Monroe and her second husband, sports star Joe DiMaggio, is often held up as a beautiful love story. But the reality is much more complicated. According to Joe and Marilyn, Legends in Love, many who knew DiMaggio have said how dangerously jealous he was of any man who was around Monroe. Some have claimed he hit and even stalked her. They would divorce after less than a year of marriage, though they remained good friends afterward. Many of DiMaggio's thoughts on his late ex-wife come from his talks with his podiatrist, Rock Positano, who recounted them at length in his book, Dinner with DiMaggio, Memories of an American Hero. DiMaggio was not shy about the recollections he shared with Positano, even when it came to his relationship with Monroe. When we got together in the bedroom, it was like the gods were fighting. There were thunderclouds and lightning above us. But the baseball player also saw the sad side of his wife's personality. He told Positano, Marilyn was a good kid, but she was a confused kid. I think you're the saddest girl I ever met. The first man ever said that. And while DiMaggio wanted children, Monroe knew her chances of having them were slim. Marilyn was hurt by her inability to have children. Hal Schaefer is not a household name today like most of Marilyn Monroe's exes, but it's possible he suffered more for his relationship with her than any other man. A musician and vocal coach in Hollywood in the 1950s, Schaefer originally met Monroe when he was hired to help her with her singing for the film, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. According to Goddess, The Secret Lives of Marilyn Monroe, she requested him as her vocal coach on several films after that. As Schaefer recalled, she stuck me as kind of fae, as not being all together in this world. Not all there. She was quiet, didn't open up much. At first, she had no confidence, but she reacted to my teaching and she got better. She really became quite good. 
Spending so much time together eventually led to an intimate relationship, which was a problem since Monroe was married to Joe DiMaggio at the time. Schaefer found himself threatened, followed, and bugged as a way for DiMaggio's associates to get information on their relationship. The vocal coach ended up attempting suicide, after which Monroe nursed him back to health. But their relationship would not survive. As for why it happened in the first place, Schaefer explained. I think she regarded it as her function, being this great attractive female that she was supposed to have sex with a man because that was something she could do, that she could give. Arthur Miller was already a famous playwright by the time he met Marilyn Monroe. Their marriage was her longest relationship lasting four and a half years before they divorced in 1961. She died the following year, and Miller spent a long time working out his demons connected to their time together. In 1964, he wrote his first play based on her, titled After the Fall. As Playbill reports, even at 87, he was still getting inspiration from Monroe. It was then that he wrote a play called Finishing the Picture, in which a Monroe-type woman is an important character who is never actually seen. As a talented writer, it's not surprising that Miller has some of the most beautiful quotes about Monroe. In Time Bends, A Life, he wrote, She was a poet on a street corner, trying to recite to a crowd pulling at her clothes. According to Marilyn Monroe, her films Her Life, he fully believed in her talent, as he said when they were married. I took her as a serious actress even before I met her. I think she's an adroit comedian, but I also think she might turn into the greatest tragic actress that can be imagined. But he also saw the worst of her demons, explaining via Frank and Marilyn, the lives, the loves, and the fascinating relationship of Frank Sinatra and Marilyn Monroe. She was a very serious girl who was struggling, against abandonment and abuse, against her family's fundamentalist religion. She was in rebellion and expected punishment. I don't worry about me. Ilya Kazan was the award-winning director of films including On the Waterfront, East of Eden, and A Streetcar Named Desire. However, his legacy was stained when he threw some of his fellow creatives under the bus in front of the House Un-American Activities Committee when it was trying to root out communists in Hollywood. This action was so controversial that when he received an honorary Oscar in 1999, hundreds protested outside the theater, and many in the audience stayed defiantly seated and didn't clap for him. Someone else who wasn't thrilled with Kazan, but for a totally different reason, was his first wife, Molly Day Thatcher. The two married in 1932, and Kazan had affairs several times, including with Marilyn Monroe. When the selected letters of Elia Kazan was published in 2014, the world learned how he explained the affair to Thatcher. While the letters read as pretty cruel to his wife, he was nicer about Monroe. Kazan explained, She was talented, funny, vulnerable, helpless in awful pain, with no hope and some worth, and not a liar, not vicious, not catty, and with a history of orphanism that was killing to hear. She was like all Charlie Chaplin's heroines in one. Marilyn Monroe was a truly iconic film star, whose beauty and talent became only more renowned after her tragic and untimely death. Monroe was found dead in her Los Angeles home on the morning of August 5, 1962. She was just 36 years old, and her cause of death was officially listed as a barbiturate overdose, due to a probable suicide. But not everyone bought the official explanation, and while Monroe's tragically young death has been a magnet for gossip and conspiracy theories since the very beginning, a new book asserts that everything we think we might know about Monroe's death is wrong. Over the years, people have speculated that everyone from President John F. Kennedy to the mob was really behind Monroe's supposed suicide. However, Mike Rothmiller, a former detective with the Organized Crime Intelligence Division of the LAPD, has claimed that Monroe's death was really orchestrated by none other than the president's brother, Robert Bobby Kennedy. Rothmiller's book, Bombshell, The Night Bobby Kennedy Killed Marilyn Monroe, asserts that Monroe's death was not really caused by a drug overdose. Instead, the former police officer claimed that Bobby Kennedy spiked Monroe's drink the night before her death, ultimately killing her. Monroe, who is believed to have had affairs with both married Kennedy brothers, was allegedly threatening to come forward and tell the world about her relationship with the famous politicians. Of course, the ambitious Kennedy family couldn't let that happen. According to Rothmiller, on the evening of August 4th, 
the younger Kennedy appeared at Monroe's home in a fury. The couple soon became engaged in a fiery fight over her diary, which contained potentially damning entries about the Kennedy brothers. Kennedy demanded she hand the diary over, but Monroe refused. The argument went on for a long time, until Kennedy finally handed Monroe an unpleasant-tasting drink, telling her to drink it. After drinking the whole glass, Monroe laid down and never woke up again. After her death, Rothmiller claimed the LAPD recovered Monroe's diary, and the entry seemed to confirm she was planning to talk. Researching through the LAPD's papers, Rothmiller discovered the potentially incriminating entries Monroe wrote in the days leading up to her death. According to Rothmiller, one entry from the week before her death read, Frank Sinatra, Peter, and others were there. Frank said, I can't keep my mouth shut. He told me to get out. I don't know why he's treating me this way. What happened to me? I was drunk. I don't remember. Did I have sex? In the next entry, which had an angrier tone, Monroe reportedly wrote, They are not calling back. Bob and John used me. I told Peter they're ignoring me. I'm not going to stand for that. I'm going to tell everyone about us. Her final entry, written the day before her death, apparently read, Peter said Robert will come tomorrow. I don't know if he will. Until his death, Bobby Kennedy denied even being in Los Angeles the night Monroe died. However, according to Rothmiller's book, Peter Lawford, John F. Kennedy's brother-in-law, confessed to the former detective just before his own death in 1984. Lawford apparently said that he had been in Monroe's home that night and witnessed the whole thing, although he claimed that he believed Kennedy had merely slipped a sedative, not poison, into her drink. A few years later, in 1988, Lawford's fourth wife, Patricia Seaton, revealed that Lawford was called by Monroe on the night she died. She also said that Lawford claimed he recognized her call as a suicide gesture, but ignored it nonetheless. Yeah, he felt guilt about it. He felt a lot of guilt about it. Those incidents seemed to haunt him a lot. Rothmiller also claims that this knowledge came at a price. Mere weeks after hearing Lawford's full story, Rothmiller was apparently attacked by an anonymous motorcycle-riding gunman who shot him in the back and side with a semi-automatic pistol. Rothmiller suffered life-threatening spinal damage, and fearing for his life, he never came forward publicly to talk about what he had learned, until his book was released in the summer of 2021. According to a 1992 report in the Los Angeles Times, LAPD investigators believe that Rothmiller faked the attack to collect a disability pension. But as bold as his claims may be, Rothmiller stands by both Lawford's word and his allegations against Bobby Kennedy. Discussing Lawford's confession, Rothmiller wrote, It was clear he had been carrying the burden of guilt for many years, and in all likelihood, this guilt had destroyed his career, and sadly, him as a human being. If I presented my evidence in any court of law, I get a conviction. If you or anyone you know is having suicidal thoughts, please call or chat online with the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. Or text HOME to the Crisis Text Line 741-741. From baseball stars to presidents, Marilyn Monroe broke a million hearts. But who was the first of them all? Even today, the legendary actress, model, and sex symbol Marilyn Monroe continues to inspire discussion, debate, and interest. All the right ingredients are there. A young, attractive woman drawn into a destructive world of glitz and glamour, a tragic death, a cavalcade of rumors regarding personal relationships and affairs, and so on. Unsurprisingly, part and parcel of the public curiosity surrounding Monroe involves an ongoing interest in the men in her life. You might not marry a girl just because she's pretty, but my goodness, doesn't it help? Monroe had three marriages and three divorces over the course of her 36-year life. It's likely that people have heard about her second and third partners, individuals who were famous in their own rights. Monroe married famed Yankees center fielder Joe DiMaggio in 1954. She was 25 and DiMaggio was 37. The marriage lasted a mere nine months. Then in 1956, Monroe married acclaimed playwright Arthur Miller, who was best known for writing Death of a Salesman. They got divorced in 1961, the year before Monroe died. But before DiMaggio and Miller, there was her first husband, one who knew Monroe by her birth name. He was James Doherty, and when they married, she was Norma Jean Mortensen. Doherty and Mortensen married in 1942 at ages 21 and 16, respectively. In fact, their wedding took place only 18 days after Mortensen turned 16. Doherty, a football captain and class president in high school, worked night shifts at Lockheed Aircraft. His family and one of Mortensen's foster families, the Goddards, lived next to each other. Grace Goddard had long been a friend of Mortensen's mother, with whom the future actress shared an acrimonious, difficult relationship. At one point, the Goddards wanted to leave California and head back to West Virginia. Mortensen wanted to stay, however, so they suggested she marry Doherty. 
Luckily, it seemed to turn out alright for both of them. As Dorothy later remembered, we loved each other madly. I felt like the luckiest guy in the world. In 1944, Dorothy joined the U.S. Merchant Marine and was shipped to Catalina Island. He later said at that time, We would go down to the beach on weekends and have luau's on Saturday night. She loved it over there. It was like being on a honeymoon for a year. James Dorothy received his divorce papers from Mortensen while he was on a merchant marine ship on China's Yangtze River. Her decision essentially boiled down to her career. 20th Century Fox didn't want Mortensen, by then known as Marilyn Monroe, to get pregnant. To the studios, this meant that she had to give up her marriage. Dorothy says that he visited Monroe after he got back to the U.S. She suggested they continue their relationship without their legal status as a married couple, but he simply could not do that. The two got divorced in 1946. Sixteen years later, Monroe was dead. After the divorce, Dorothy went on to enjoy a full and happy life. He married two more times, first in 1947 to Patricia Dorothy. They divorced in 1972, and two years later, James married Rita Dorothy, who died in 2003 while they were still married. Reportedly, Dorothy never mentioned Monroe to his second wife, Patricia, and he never saw any of her movies. James Dorothy is known for more than his marriage to Marilyn Monroe, too. For 25 years, he worked for the Los Angeles Police Department, and during that time, he implemented the city's first special weapons and tactics team. He also taught criminal science and once uncovered a plot to kidnap actor James Garner. In 1974, Dorothy retired to Maine, where he served on the Maine Boxing Commission and even ran for Congress. In 2002, we recounted hearing the call about Monroe's death. He told the Associated Press, I had almost been expecting it. Fame was injurious to her. She was too gentle to be an actress. She wasn't tough enough for Hollywood. And once someone starts getting into pills, uppers and downers, the way she was, people can go downhill. They can't sleep, so they take more and more pills. Dorothy wrote two books about his time with Monroe, 1976's The Secret Happiness of Marilyn Monroe and 2001's To Norma Jean with Love, Jimmy. Speaking to the Portland Press Herald in 2001, Dorothy said, I've done a lot of things in my life, but that's the thing everyone asked me about, Norma Jean. It's all right with me, it was part of my life. James Dorothy died from leukemia in 2005. A $7 sheet cake, getting suddenly fired, and a savior in Dean Martin. Something had to give on the set of Marilyn Monroe's last movie. Something's Gotta Give was set to be a remake of the 1940 comedy My Favorite Wife. The plot is about a woman stranded on a deserted island with a stranger for five years. Her husband, played by Dean Martin, assumes she's died, so he remarries. When she's finally rescued, the poor husband now has two wives and struggles to keep his life afloat. Something's Gotta Give was continuously delayed, with the start of production pushed from January to March 1962 due to problems finalizing the script. Delays mounted and 20th Century Fox began to worry about it ever getting finished. But director George Cukor didn't get the memo. He spent time and money having his own house replicated as the set, and he was happy to waste more time on unimportant details like getting a dog to bark on cue. As a result, the set was a pressure cooker, with studio execs pushing for a fast release while the schedule slipped further and further behind. Marilyn Monroe was a huge star, but she joined the production of Something's Gotta Give under several dark clouds. For one thing, she hadn't worked or even been on a film set in a year. The previous year had been rough for her. She divorced Arthur Miller, spent some time in a psychiatric hospital for depression, and had her gallbladder removed, a surgery that reportedly left a very large scar across her belly. The result of all that stress was a diminished movie star who was thinner than she'd ever been before. She'd also lost confidence in her judgment. In his book The Final Years of Marilyn Monroe, author Keith Badman notes that she repeatedly rejected the script for Something's Gotta Give because she was acutely aware that she'd made poor choices in the past and no longer trusted her instincts. Simply put, she wasn't ready to go back to work. After signing on to make Something's Gotta Give, Monroe fell ill almost immediately, causing her to miss multiple days of work. She provided doctor's notes that claimed she was suffering from various ailments, including high fevers, sinusitis, and a viral infection. Worse, when she did appear on set, she often locked herself in her trailer and had to be coaxed out. Her stress was reportedly so bad that a childhood stutter returned, making it difficult for her to recite her lines. George Cukor initially tried to accommodate Monroe's health issues by filming around her, but this could only work to a certain extent. In the first 30 days of filming, she missed 17 days. Producer Henry Weinstein frequently found her throwing up before having to perform her scenes and once even found her unconscious from a barbiturate overdose. He wanted to stop filming in light of her fragile health, but the studio, facing increasing financial stress, refused. And I tell you, the girl is not able to do this yet. 
When Something's Gotta Give went into production in 1962, 20th Century Fox was also making Cleopatra. The latter film eventually had a reported budget of about $44 million, a staggering sum in 1962, and equivalent to about $415 million in today's dollars. Another project, The Longest Day, was also costing a lot more than the studio had planned, in the form of about $10 million. These overruns had executives in a panic, and Something's Gotta Give was seen as a quick way to make some fast money to avoid bankruptcy. But as the shooting schedule fell behind due to Monroe's absences and illnesses, tensions on the set began to rise. Studio executives couldn't go after Cleopatra star Elizabeth Taylor, who was paid a record $1 million to appear in the film. But they could, and did, view Monroe and her $100,000 paycheck as a scapegoat for their problems. According to the final years of Marilyn Monroe, Monroe was initially reluctant to sign on to Something's Gotta Give because she didn't like the script. She didn't have contractual script approval, so the studio didn't have to take any of her suggestions, but that didn't matter. If she didn't approve of something, she was legendary for simply not showing up until it was changed. So the studio worked with her to revise the script over and over again until she was satisfied. But even after production began, the script continued to change on an almost daily basis. As recounted in the book Marilyn Monroe, Her Films, Her Life, the producers began distributing new script pages on colored paper so the cast and crew would know what had changed. But then they switched to sending Monroe standard white pages because the color system confused her. As a result, she would often discover that after working hard to learn her new lines, those lines had changed again when she arrived on set. By the time Marilyn Monroe began filming Something's Gotta Give at the age of 35, she was already considered old for her sex symbol persona. She was well aware that this reputation mattered and that it depended entirely on her physical appearance. This is why Something's Gotta Give's swimming pool scene has become iconic, despite the film never getting a proper release. Monroe's character Ellen goes skinny dipping in her husband's house to entice him to come down to her. The actress was given a flesh-colored swimsuit, but she decided impulsively to remove it, as she instead actually swam naked and invited photographers to document the moment. This wasn't erratic behavior, rather it was a calculated gambit. Monroe knew that she had competition, most notably Elizabeth Taylor. When she invited photographers to capture the moment, she stipulated that when they published the photos, Taylor couldn't be mentioned in the same issue. Did you always take a moonlight swim on the island with Adam, Eve? You might think that if you're a big star and your birthday rolls around while you're filming a movie, everyone would throw you a big party. But when Marilyn Monroe turned another year older during Something's Gotta Give, it was a little underwhelming. Her stand-in, Evelyn Moriarty, started to plan a surprise party for the actress. As reported in the book Icon, The Lifetimes and Films of Marilyn Monroe, she collected $7 from the cast and crew and purchased a sheet cake, decorated in honor of the famous swimming pool scene. Alas, George Cukor reportedly ordered that the cake be hidden away and the party held off until after production had wrapped, so that he could get a full day's work for Monroe. And as a final insult to their star, Cukor and the studio executives didn't even attend the party when it was finally allowed to happen. One of the most iconic moments in Marilyn Monroe's life is her performance of Happy Birthday at Madison Square Garden in honor of President John F. Kennedy. But this famous moment made the already chaotic set of Something's Gotta Give even worse. According to the book Marilyn Monroe, Her Films, Her Life, 20th Century Fox had given Monroe permission to attend the event back at the beginning of the year when she signed on to the film. But she then missed so much work due to frequent illnesses that studio execs were outraged that she was apparently healthy enough to attend a party on the other side of the country. George Cukor was also reportedly particularly upset about the appearance. When Monroe arrived in New York, she was informed that the studio had issued a breach of contract notice. Everybody, happy birthday! After the happy birthday incident, tensions on the set were running high. According to the book Marilyn Monroe, Private and Confidential, the actress continued to call in sick despite the rising tensions, and she also refused to work when Dean Martin had a cold. On June 2nd, just a day after turning 36, she once again refused to show up to work and then called in sick again two days later, prompting Martin to storm off the set in frustration. This was reportedly the last straw. After threatening Monroe with a lawsuit on June 7, 1962, the studio announced that she'd been fired due to what it described as spectacular absenteeism. Producer Henry Weinstein calculated that over the course of 32 days of production, she'd only shown up for work 12 days. Worse, when she did show up, she wasn't exactly efficient, only getting the equivalent of four days' work done in that time. As reported by the book Marilyn Monroe, Private and Confidential, 20th Century Fox eventually sued their star for breach of contract, 
asking for $500,000 in damages. But that was just the tip of the iceberg. Her co-star Dean Martin refused to work with a different actress as he stated that part of the reason he'd agreed to be in the film was because of Monroe. His refusal to get back to work prompted his other co-star, Sid Charisse, to sue him in turn for $14,000 in damages, and the studio also sued him for $500,000. As time went on, Fox came to view Martin as the real problem, claiming he'd verbally agreed to consider replacement actresses and then didn't follow through with that agreement. Ultimately, the studio sued Martin for an astounding $3,339,000, more than $30 million in today's money. He casually countersued, demanding $6,885,000. At the same time, the studio increased the damages they were seeking for Monroe to $750,000. In the end, none of these suits went anywhere, and no one won any damages from anyone. I know how upset you get about little things. Little things? On June 7, 1962, Monroe was fired from Something's Gotta Give for her chronic absenteeism. But then, as reported in Marilyn Monroe, her films Her Life, she was rehired a month and a half later on August 1st. And she wasn't just rehired, she was also granted a long list of bonuses. First and foremost, she got an immediate raise from $100,000 to $250,000. Second, she was also given a $1 million contract for two more films, raising her salary to $500,000 per film. And possibly most important for Monroe, George Cukor was replaced by director Jean Negalesco. After being sent away, she was back and now triumphant. Just exactly why the studio made such an abrupt about-face remains the topic of furious speculation. Many believe that Dean Martin's refusal to consider working with any other actress had a lot to do with it. It's also been speculated that she was simply a unique box office attraction who was irreplaceable. Whatever the reasons, on August 1, 1962, Monroe was at a professional high point. She never got to enjoy it, though. Just three days later, she was dead. After Marilyn Monroe's death, 20th Century Fox shut down production on Something's Gotta Give and took a reported loss of about $2 million. As reported in the book The Immortal Marilyn, the studio locked away all of the footage from the production and claimed for years that Monroe's appearance and performance were too bad to be seen. For decades, this was the accepted story. A troubled production ruined by a star whose mental and physical state prevented her from delivering a decent performance. But then, in 2001, the studio finally released an edited version of the usable footage from the shoot, and the results were eye-opening. Monroe fit the part of a classic Hollywood beauty in her scenes, and a review of the nine hours or so of raw footage shows her to be professional and patient. And her performance doesn't betray any signs of the onset turmoil or her physical ailments. As recounted in Marilyn Monroe, her films Her Life, 20th Century Fox salvaged what it could from the debacle by recasting the film with James Garner and Doris Day, and changing the title to Move Over, Darling. That film was a decent hit for the studio in 1963, but it's largely forgotten today, unlike the completely unforgettable Marilyn Monroe. Anything else you want to ask? If you or anyone you know is struggling with addiction issues, help is available. Visit the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration website or contact SAMHSA's National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP. That's 1-800-662-4357. Knife-wielding breakdowns, abusive relationships at 16, and kidnappings with a duffel bag, Marilyn Monroe's mother, Gladys Pearl Baker, had her fair share of transit. While we don't know much about Gladys Pearl Baker's childhood, we do know that she was born on May 27, 1902, and suffered from near poverty and undiagnosed schizophrenia. At age 16, she was married to 24-year-old John Newton Baker, who turned out to be abusive. Considering all this, it's not hard to understand why she chose to give away her daughter, Norma Jean, to foster care, only two weeks after she was born in 1926. Baker and her husband had two other children, Jackie and Bernice, before they got divorced in 1923. She received custody of the kids, but he kidnapped them and fled to Kentucky. It's unclear if Gladys then stayed behind in California or moved there. At one point, she briefly remarried to Martin Edward Mortensen, from whom Marilyn Monroe gets her legal last name. But Gladys claimed that Monroe's father was actually a co-worker at Consolidated Studios named Charles Stanley Gifford. Gladys and Mortensen separated after less than a year, and Norma Jean's paternity remained unclear her entire life. Her early years were spent in a stable, very religious home in Hawthorne, California, with her foster parents, Ida and Wayne Bolander. Meanwhile, her mother barely made ends meet as a film cutter at RKO Radio Studios in Hollywood. Gladys Pearl Baker wanted to play an active role in her daughter's life, but visits to the Bolander household and sleepovers at her apartment quickly turned dangerous. 
On one occasion, she showed up when Norma Jean was three and stuffed her in a duffel bag, though Ida Bolander managed to stop her. Over the years, Gladys continued to request the Bolanders return her daughter to her, but they refused, and Gladys tried to get herself together. By the time Norma Jean was seven in 1933, her mother had gotten a loan for a house and taken in actors George and Maude Atkinson to help cover costs. Alas, this brief upturn in fortune came to an end later that year. Gladys received news that her son Jackie had died. Almost the same time, she learned that her grandfather hanged himself and her entire studio was going on strike. Then, in 1934, she suffered a nervous breakdown. Reports described her wielding a knife in public and claiming that someone was trying to kill her. She was then institutionalized at a state hospital in Norwalk, California. To learn that she was my mother uh, was quite a shock. It was the woman with the red hair. This is where things get truly horrific for both mother and daughter. Norma Jean's foster care passed to Gladys' friend Grace McKee. Around this time, the future movie star's aspirations started to take off. McKee was a busy lady, though, and she asked the judge to grant Norma Jean half-orphan status, which allowed her to live intermittently with other caregivers. While Norma Jean passed between 10 homes and one orphanage from 1935 to 1942, her mother passed between hospitals, and they saw each other only sporadically. In 1942, a 16-year-old Norma Jean married a police officer named James Doherty, but that marriage ended in 1946, the same year that Gladys was released from San Jose's Agnews State Hospital. She said that she was going to move to Oregon to live with her aunt, but instead she married John Stuart Ely, who already had a wife back in Idaho. The mother and daughter were seeing each other a bit at this point, and when Norma Jean tried to warn Gladys about her new husband's other marriage, Gladys reportedly said, That's how much Norma Jean hates me. She'll do anything to ruin my life because she still believes I ruined hers. Gladys also disapproved of her daughter's career choice. Meanwhile, the studio wanted to bury any information about their new star's mother. As Marilyn Monroe began to star in movies in the late 40s and early 50s, she went along with the story that 20th Century Fox urged her to tell. Her parents had died and she was an orphan, and she had no idea who they were. This led to no less than five women falsely claiming to be her mother. Gladys Baker, meanwhile, was going around saying the same thing, but nobody believed her. In 1952, a columnist found Gladys working at a nursing home in Eagle Rock outside of Los Angeles. The story blew open and Monroe confessed the truth. When this revelation hit the news, Gladys suffered another mental breakdown. This time, she was institutionalized in Rock Haven Sanitarium in La Crescenta, California. The following year, Monroe's career exploded thanks to the release of Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. Gladys then wrote letter after letter to her daughter begging to be released from Rock Haven. Monroe reportedly visited the sanitarium before her mother was admitted and found it to be highly disturbing. But instead of establishing direct contact, she sent her mother a monthly allowance. She also left her $5,000 a year in her will from a $100,000 trust. Gladys lived in Rock Haven all the way through her daughter's death in 1962. Please, Mother, what do you think I should do? I think that you should stop coming to see me because you never ask me how I'm doing. The year before Marilyn Monroe's death in 1961, she confessed to having suicidal ideations. The press caught wind, the story aired on TV, and Gladys was found in her room with her left wrist slit. A year after her daughter died, Gladys climbed out of a window at Rock Haven. She then climbed a wire mesh fence and walked 15 miles to a church on Foothill Boulevard. She huddled near a water heater for warmth in the church's utility room. When the police found her, she said she'd run away to practice Christian science teaching. She was then taken back to Rock Haven. She was eventually released and moved to Florida, where she died of heart failure in 1984. There's been speculation that Monroe inherited an unspecified mental illness from her mother, though she was never diagnosed. There is indeed a genetic component to mental illness, although shared environmental factors between parents and their kids can make it hard to pinpoint. If you or anyone you know is having suicidal thoughts, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline by dialing 988 or by calling 1-800-273-TALK-8255.